In the last video, I talked about Le Chatelier's concentration <coughs> changing and the more complicated problems that exist in concentration changes. Uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about pressure and temperature with respect to Le Chatelier. So I have three examples of pressure here. <clears throat> so the first thing you have to know is I'm actually, I have to change the volume in order for it to affect the pressure in order for it to then change my equilibrium. It's not just pressure alone. It's actually a concentration issue. And so if I change the, the volume, I'm changing the concentration of those gases. But this is paying particular attention to just gases. It's not about concentration of ions or aqueous or this is just about gases. So if I change the volume of the container, I change the pressure of the gas, the gases don't like that pressure change and so they shift to restore that pressure, the equilibrium pressure. So it is a pressure problem but we're changing the volume, we have to change the volume. If I were to just take this chamber and like cram in a bunch of argon in order to like increase the pressure in the chamber, the, the molecules don't care about that, they don't do anything to shift. Okay, so in, uh, putting an inert gas into an equilibrium system doesn't change the equilibrium. Okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Uh, here's one example. If I take some of this and equilibrium with this, um, and I play with the volume, so I'm going to take this chamber that these two things are mixed in, and I'm going to decrease the volume. Well, if I squish that balloon, it's going to increase the pressure. If I increase the pressure, this equilibrium wants to shift to the side that makes the pressure lower. Because it's like, what, all this pressure? Don't like this pressure, I'm gonna shift to the side so I don't have to feel all this pressure anymore. Right, it's like, it's like a stroppy teenager who's like, uh, you know, mom is like, study, 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 and the teenager's like, whatever, shifting to the side and no pressure, right? Whereas if the mom's like, sure, you know, like, go ahead, then the teenager's like, oh, I'm gonna, anyway, you get it, whatever. Anyway, here we go. So, decreasing the volume, increasing the pressure, I'm gonna shift to the side with the less moles of gas to restore the pressure, therefore it shifts right. Now this is quite wordy and I find that there are two types of students that I teach. One that they're like, it's a sentence, I got it, I've memorized it, it's fine, I can do it. And the other group of people that are just like, Ugh, it was like all of these words that didn't like stick. So for those people who are more visual thinkers, this is what I do. I draw this little diagram for you, okay? So if I have like a, a, a box and I'm literally squishing this lid, decreasing the volume in this box, and these are like those wooden building blocks that you have when you're a kid. So here I have two moles of gas, two blocks. Here I have one mole of gas, one block. If I were to squish the lid of this container, these blocks would come tumbling down first. So they're going to tumble in this direction. So this also, this picture shows that these blocks, this system is going to shift to the right, tumble to the right, okay? Which is going to end up with more of this and less of that. Okay, here's another example. Uh, so the analogy I use for this is not a bathtub, but rather it's this squishy box. Okay, so if I have sulfur dioxide and oxygen making sulfur trioxide, and in this case, I'm going to increase the volume. Right, I'm gonna lift up the box, which makes it less pressurized inside. So if there's less, less pressure, these gaseous molecules go, and I can only look at gas. If there was a liquid in here, I'm not even gonna pay attention to it. It's not gonna be part of my box. So the gas molecules go, you've decreased all the pressure. I'm gonna step up my game, and I'm gonna increase the pressure because I want that pressure to be exactly the same as it was before. So it's gonna to shift to the left, the side with more moles of gas to restore the pressure, right? You decrease the pressure, I'm gonna to shift to the side that has more moles of gas so I can increase that pressure and maybe bring it back to normality. In terms of like the visual uh, analogy, so that's like taking the lid of this box and lifting it up, which means that these guys can expand further, the first, faster, whatever. And so uh, that's like shifting it to the left so that these guys can increase and these guys need to decrease in order for that to happen. Okay, uh, one more example. Here I have some HCl, uh, these are all gases. I just didn't, so gas, gas, and gas. Uh, if I change the volume here, it is not going to change the pressure uh, because it's a two to two ratio. So if I have these blocks that are exactly the same height, one, two, one, two, no matter who I squish, 
or lift up or whatever, they're both affected at the same time. And so changing the volume to change the pressure in this situation would have no change on the equilibrium because shifting left or right does not get to restore that pressure for it. Okay, Le Chatelier and temperature. So temperature is a little bit weird because um, it, it feels like you're being told different things at different times because some reactions are exothermic and so they follow that pathway and some uh, are endothermic and so they follow that pathway. The important thing to remember is these two did no change to the K value and these ones do change the K value. Okay, that's like super important to recognize. And in fact, actually, let's talk about how this changes the K value over here. Okay, when we get to the end there. So this is no change to the K value. These ones do, temperature does change, not these ones, sorry, duh. Temperature changes the K value. Okay, so here's two examples. Here I have an equilibrium. It tells me that this is an endothermic reaction. There's my energy in the, they might give you a number, they might give you an E, whatever. So this is tying in again with unit one, where the thermochemistry unit, where you learn that energy as a reactant must be endothermic. Okay, so if I increase the heat of this flask where everything's all present in there and I turn up the heat, this wants to turn down the heat. So it's a little bit like in the middle of the winter when somebody in your house goes over to that thermostat and goes doot, 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 and just increases it just a degree or two, there's always somebody else that comes in and goes, hey, who turned up the temperature? And do, 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 and tries to turn it down again. That sounds like my brother, that's my brother. So um, if they're decreasing, if you've increased the heat, it's like, who turned up the temperature? I wanna decrease the heat. So it's going to, turning up the heat is the same thing as turning up the energy. Turning up the energy, now this is where we can use the same bathtub analogy. If I've dumped in a whole bunch of energy, it's going to shift to the right to replace or to use it up, right? So it shifts to the right to use up all that extra energy that you just put in there, which results in an increase in my HCl, an increase in that compound, and a decrease in those two compounds, okay? You made it hot, and so it does more endothermic to cool it down. Always does the opposite. Okay, here's another example. So here I have this example, and the question is, what happens when I cool it? Well, it doesn't give you energy in here at all, and so we have to go back into our unit one, reminding ourselves that I can figure out the delta H of a reaction when they give me nothing. I can use Hess's law sum of formations. And so the sum of the number of moles of the delta H of the formations in your data booklet of the products minus the same thing for the reactants. So plugging the numbers in from your data booklet and you see that this is negative a number. I don't actually even care about the number. I just care about the negative. The negative tells me exothermic. So I can go back to my reaction and I can say, hey, that means energy is a product. If energy is a product and I am cooling this system, then I am taking out the energy. If I take out the energy, the system shifts to replace it. So cooling it is decreasing the heat, which is decreasing the energy. I'm gonna shift right to replace it, which is gonna result in more of this and less of these, okay? So in other words, you cooled it, it tries to warm it up by doing the exo more of the exothermic process. This is in equilibrium, so it's doing a little bit of the exo and a little bit of the endo at the same time. But because you cooled it, it's going to go, ugh, I had everything balanced and you just messed it up. So I'm going to do more exo until I can get it back to being restored again. Okay, but I did say it doesn't successfully restore it. It doesn't actually keep your K value constant. It does end up changing that K value. That's why whenever we're reporting a K value, we put the temperature beside it because changing the temperature does change the K value. For example, if I have a solubility, right, a bunch of salt and a couple ions, and I increase the warmth of that system, you know I can dissolve more, so I must shift the equilibrium towards the products on those things for the most part. Okay, so here I have uh, my change in KC. So remember KC is products over reactants. So in this case, I've made more products and I've made less reactants when I shifted it. More products, less reactants. So this fraction here, a bigger number over a smaller number, ends up with a bigger KC value. So in this case, 
cooling the reaction will result in a increase in Kc. But just for this reaction, you gotta pay attention. Not all cooling increases the Kc because all exothermic cooling would increase the Kc, but all endothermic cooling would decrease the Kc. And so just working it out and doing this little ratio is probably your safest bet rather than memorizing a whole table of things to do. Okay, so that's Le Chatelier, the three things that affect equilibrium. Catalysts do not affect the equilibrium. They increase the rate of the forward and the reverse at the same time, so there's no change. Inert gases, like I said, they do change the pressure, but they don't affect the equilibrium. So the only things that shift equilibrium are concentration, changing the volume, and then looking at the pressure and the temperature of the system. These two will, will keep K constant, and this one will change the K value.